This episode of The Modern Rogue brought to you by Privacy.com. Go to Privacy.com forward slash rogue and get $5 off your first purchase. Yeah, and spend that $5 on us, like, to do a dance for you. We should have an animated GIF that costs $5 yeah, and probably. it's just us dancing. It, does it cost play, $5? Play, play the baby dance. <laughs> That's a $5 gift that They're you can They're going to have the kiosks. <laughs> In airports? Have you heard the good news? And it's bus stops? This guy dances like a baby. You just walk <laughs> up and you swipe your privacy.com card and you get dancing baby. Grown man. <laughs> baby Ben. It's going to be huge. It was and illegal. And now it's just like, uh, yeah, no, throw that in my drink. It, go ahead. No, no, you go. No, no, you go. No, no, after you. No, after you. No, 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 I'm sorry. Excuse me, I didn't mean to offend. Pardon me, I go macerate in a shrub. Excuse me. Understanding absence. All right, so we're back at the Parker Jazz Club, hanging out with our BFF, okay. Trevor Frambach, our Mixmaster MC. So how weird is it that we were alive at a time when everybody thought absinthe was freaking LSD in liquid form? And it was illegal. Not only illegal, but I remember somebody describing like, man, I was at Burning Man and I tried absinthe. It was crazy. And now it's just like, uh, hey, uh, I'll take a Diet Coke and some absinthe. <laughs> <laughs> is that a thing? Has anyone ever ordered Diet Coke and no, absinthe? That's I, I the don't world's get... worst drink. Because that sounds awful. <laughs> Diet Coke and absinthe. It is not that prevalent, but I do have a question for both of you. Do you know what the ingredient was in absinthe? I do. People, wow. Uh, wormwood. Wormwood comes from a German word. Meaning the wood of worms. Got it, he's still, man, look <laughs> You're at close. it. You're close, you're close. I don't he's know. He's so good. I'm not sure if that's what vermouth meant. Vermouth? Yes. Wait, uh, what's funny is I was totally bluffing and I was right. So if so many people were tripping and hallucinating and having these crazy times and killing their family on absinthe, why weren't they doing it when they were drinking vermouth, which has wormwood in it. So I suppose we should talk about the mythology around absinthe. And, and uh, number one, we know that the placebo thing is a very powerful thing. It, it's a real thing, yeah. right? We also know that you can hallucinate if you have enough booze. So the hallucinogen oh, thing boy, isn't do I know. exactly wrong, but uh, but but where did this mythos come from? This this the, the green fairy, the idea that this is some kind of magical stuff. And why did they make it illegal? That's that's insane. So 18th century, it started to be used medicinally by a a doctor named Pierre Ordinaire, and it was in Switzerland. And it was used as just kind of a, a panacea, a cure-all. Yeah, like a snake oil. Yeah, exactly. And later in the 20th century, everyone started adopting it, like Edgar Allan Poe, Ernest Hemingway, Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah. It was the drink of artists and bohemians and painters. Was this an, uh, like guilt by association? Because absinthe was their favorite drink, they started to figure these weird artist types, these hippies of the uh, previous century. There was a particular incident that triggered the hysteria that really led to absinthe being vilified and that was the land frame murders. Yeah, but mur murders? Murders. Okay. Yeah. Much like the starting point of most spirits, I mean, and drinks, it's all apocryphal, but the land frame murders is what kind of push people over the edge into believing that absinthe could cause you to become feral or hallucinate or just be out of your mind. Set the stage for me. This occurs at what time? 1905, somewhere around there, this Swiss farmer killed his family after being at a bar and having two shots two shots of absinthe. Two shots? This man was a drunk and was drinking bathtub brandy and gin as well as wine. Back then there were really no regulations on how spirits were made, so the people that were making it highly overproofed toxic chemicals in it. Like paint thinner. And they even found uh, what they called copper salts. We have our first instance bath of salt, bath, bath salts. salts. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, did he try to eat their face? Um, yeah. I don't know <laughs> if that was after he used his ax, but maybe. Oh, was it with an ax? Yeah. Oh dear, I can understand the hysteria. <laughs> Plus also, this is back before you had the, the ability to, to measure blood alcohol content. You just had to take their word for it. <laughs> and newsflash, alcoholics, not the best truth tellers. Yeah, and so this is where all of this legend and lore built up around this really simple drink of people thinking, oh, the green fairy, it'll make you hallucinate. So the wormwood is not a hallucinogen and is in vermouth and also absinthe. Here's why I really think absinthe was demonized. The licorice flavor, the anise. Gross, <laughs> I'm not a fan. Uh, I love it. 
it's great. I hate it's great. it. It's great. Funny thing about absinthe is it is called the green fairy, but actually when it's distilled, quite typically it's clear. The green anise that is used can add the color. Also, when you're using botanicals, it's the chlorophyll over time that turns it green. That's amazing. I guess at this point, science says that all of the demonization of absinthe is total nonsense, and what you're really buying into now in the 21st century is the experience of kind of the lore. The it, ritual. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's a ritual to it. There's a bunch of ghost stories that we have associated with it. It feels naughty and exotic. Uh, so how do we properly prepare an absinthe drink? What you're looking for is because absinthe is that licorice, that green anise, it is very bitter and it is very love. It. You're, it's Love right up your alley. It. It's not for everyone, but what you're looking for is four to five parts water and sugar to one part absinthe. Oh, wow. What is the proof of absinthe by itself? That is where some of the lore comes from because people were so messed up on absinthe because it was a very high proof alcohol. You're talking you know, anywhere from 120 proof to 130 proof. We're talking Everclear territory. Oh yeah. You're about to degrease an engine with this stuff. Regulation lightened up in the 90s as the Europeans uh, adopted uh, more modern uh, food and drink laws. And so that's when we started to see the ban started to lift and everyone started to think, oh, okay, well, we can drink absinthe. It's just licorice flavored nastiness. So good, so good. So let's say I buy a bottle of absinthe and I don't want to look like a total chump as I present it to my friends. What, what is the ritual? Because I know that that's part of it. The ritual matters, right? Right, absolutely. What we're going to be using today is actually the Pernod, which is the original distiller in France, Pernod Fee. And this actually isn't a true absinthe. A true absinthe is going to be what is known as the Holy Trinity, which has your fennel, green anise, and wormwood. Okay, I know two of those words. What is fennel? Uh, fennel's a seed uh, from the carrot family. It's uh, uh, an herb. Ah, the carrot family. Yes. Uh, all 24 of them. They're delightful. <laughs> no? No. I'm sorry. What you're going to see on the market isn't true absinthe, but it is absinthe-like. Now, it isn't a liqueur, it is a spirit because of the alcohol volume. Okay, uh, spirit and liqueur, what's the difference between those? Uh, a liqueur is going to be 30 percent and under. Got it, got it. So it's mainly sugar water with a bit of uh, alcoholic spice, right. whereas uh, uh, spirit is just like, no, this is the real word. But if you go to a bar and you just order absinthe, you very well could get this particular brand. Exactly. Okay. And this is one of the most popular on the market, so you're going to see this at a lot of bars. So how do you properly prepare? What's the dance? Everybody acts like, like in my mind, it's like you say absinthe and suddenly a sitar plays. And You've got and, like and, a flared and, and, cuff, yeah, like and ruffles. Yeah, there, there's incense, and, you know. Maybe somebody's a vampire. Everybody is dancing. Yeah, Bauhaus is playing. Yes. Yeah. Bram Stoker's Bauhaus. ghost is in the yeah. corner just reading. Yes. The traditional way to serve it is with water in a sugar cube. And it's simply, like I said, four parts to one. We're going to pour in about an ounce and a half. Now, if you look, see how green that is? Yeah, man. That's it looks like, like a chartreuse. That's like electric lime Gatorade. This uh, particular version of Pernod. This is a much sweeter one, so I am going to be using a brown sugar cube on this. I thought those were croutons. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my god, I want to live at Jason Murphy's bar <laughs> where he just goes by what things look like. I was like, that's it's he clearly. Order and he grabs a crouton with garlic on it and runs water over it. That'd be amazing. Traditionally, you're going to be using a uh, granulated sugar white sugar, fine sugar, as a cube. And they do make absinthe drippers to where you can just kind of turn the spout and it slowly pours over until it dissolves. Yeah. We don't have that kind of time, but the brown sugar does dissolve well, a little bit quicker. you can see already quicker. it's clouding up as mm -hmm. the sugar goes in there. Isn't there like a thing where you burn it or something too? Yeah, you can light the sugar keep on fire, but honestly, that is all pomp and circumstance. And yeah, if which any, I'm into. <laughs> if anything, it will ruin the flavor of the absinthe. Oh, never mind. I'm no longer <laughs> into it. I used to be into it. I used to dally with that. So if we do this a couple of times, and like I said, this, I think the, the brown sugar cubes tend to dissolve a little bit quicker than the white. This isn't a traditional absinthe spoon. They'll be garish and just very ornate and antique looking and they're slotted. And have like one purpose. Exactly, and I don't have use for it. So I'm just using my old julep strainer. And so it's pretty much dissolved there, so. And that's, that's it? Yeah, that's so it This right is there. the green fairy. And typically you would serve it on a plate maybe with a ornate doily. No. Oh my God. I cannot. It's, just, it's, it's licorice. It's straight licorice. It's amazing. I cannot 
overstate the importance of ritual and the placebo effect and all this stuff. Yeah. Like when you believe that crossing this line will change everything in your life, it changes the way you experience it. That's something that the folks over at the Whiskey Vault are really good about is that presentation is key when it comes to presenting people with the story of the whiskey. All of that matters to your subjective experience of how good it is. So it's like knowing that this is the green fairy that inspired artists and made uh, madmen out of farmers. Other... Yeah, exactly, right? All of that matters. I mean, I don't know if I'm a bad person, but you can really tell that it's diluted, and I wonder how it tastes straight. But but that's, I guess, a cultural no-no? No, I mean, you can drink it straight if you want to. There's nothing that says that you can't. I've seen you drink worse things straight. It is very intense, though. This is great, and I'm sure there's amazing cocktails we can make. I kind of want to experience just the, the raw. Well, let's do it. Now, I know you don't like sweet things. This is a very, very sweet spirit here. Okay, you added sugar before. It just looks like Gatorade. I just pictured like a plume of smoke and you're standing there in a velvet jacket now. <laughs> There's a reason that they dilute it. And they're right. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. What did you experience? Uh, oh. Just a bit much. No, no. It's just a bit much. Remember chartreuse face? It's the difference between um, enjoying a lemon flavored beverage and having sour uh, warheads. <laughs> you feel your tongue going numb like, yet? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Absinthe, less complicated than I thought. Also, less uh, hallucinogenic than I thought. <laughs> uh, literally, everything I thought was great about absinthe uh, turns out to be a lie. Just wait. S absinthe is the Santa Claus of drinks. And there he is. <laughs> yes, Brian, you've been a very good drinker. I just wish you had just gone with that and turned around and just had this long conversation with Santa Claus. And we just. That's a Patreon bonus. <laughs> yeah. Trevor and I are sitting here getting more and more terrified. Like... Meanwhile, if you guys want to meet Trevor in person, come on down to the Parker Jazz Club here in Austin, Texas. Fourth uh, in Colorado. Uh, what, what's that? Fourth in Colorado. Oh, I, I, thought, I thought you said it was in Colorado. I was very confused <laughs> no. for for a second. No. Where are we right now? <laughs> and of course you're doing the Barstool Theory stuff now. Yeah, soon we'll be teaching classes here about spirits and cocktails. So. Barstooltheory.com. Uh, it's not up yet, but I'm gonna get it up soon. You, uh, did you hear that, ladies? <laughs> no? no. <laughs> Go talk to Santa. Jason Murphy, how many cards do you have? Oh God, not this conversation yes, again. Yes. Really? Wait, what, 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 what do you got? One, two. What do you need? I've got, I've got two cards that I use mostly. Not enough. You should have a different card for every single website you ever visit. That sounds complicated and hard to keep it's track of. It's not. If you do a little thing called privacy.com, it just creates this smoke screen that no one can tell what I'm buying, even if they're looking at a list of things that I've bought. Okay, first of all, I do love that. The the fact that uh, when you go through the purchases, it just says Nunya by business, <laughs> you know? And you can put whatever you want in there. You decide the level of, of, of transparency that you want. One of the things I like is the ability to manufacture burners on the fly. Like I've got three little girls and sometimes they want to spend money on their apps, their iOS whatevers. And I'm just like, uh, hey kiddo, here's a $20 card that's your card enjoy. Do you remember the first time that we had privacy as a sponsor? We full on showed the number on, oh, the, yeah. on the site. And then Too I, late? I got all the emails of everybody trying to use those numbers. How Guess many what? tried? Enough. Enough. <laughs> enough. Look, we live in an age where, of course, we all know the hygiene of having different passwords for different websites. You don't have the same password for everything. You should do the same thing when it comes to your financial information. You should have a different card for all that. Nothing makes it easier than privacy.com. And one of the more important things to remember is that privacy com is completely free to use. They get the merchant fees from the people running the yeah. business or whatever. And then once I sat down to do it, it literally took me like five minutes. Privacy.com slash rogue. When you sign up, you get $5 free to spend on anything, including, oh wait, is it Black Friday? Are a bunch of people buying stuff online? Right now you can go to shop.themodernrogue.com and have $5 to spend on our store. Yeah, and Who they have, have thought it? like military grade encryption. I won't get into the details because it was very complicated, but basically it boiled down to the two key system from War Games yeah. where they can get at your information. Plus they all wear camouflage and they're all flexing with their guns. They're a really intense operation and they're like, and hey, they're not messing around. Hey man, what's this? You're like, it's private. Welcome to privacy.com. Private. That's what they, private, <laughs> private. <laughs> privacy.com forward slash rogue.
to get $5 off your first purchase. Yeah. Spend it at shop.themodernroad.com. You should. It's a good thing to do. It's the holiday season. All right, what is the most dangerous thing you've ever drank? You are talking to a person who eats fire for a living. Uh, gasoline, uh, freaking uh, naphtha, benzene. <laughs> you win. Uh, kerosene. <laughs> you want me to keep going? I thought I had a pretty good one. Rosto I do lighter not. Fluid. Zippo lighter fluid. Yeah, I'm worried about you now. <laughs>